invite Jackie to come up. Lord, we thank you for Jackie. We thank you for the word that you've laid on her heart. And we ask that our hearts are open to receive what she has to say to us this morning. Amen. Amen. Good morning. I can honestly say it's always a joy to come back to Christ Church. It's just like coming home. And um, I was thinking through the week um, as I was preparing for today about my first visit to this building. It was 2008. I think it was July. And um, we were going through a uh, difficult time in our existing church up in Stopsley, looking for a new church home. And I said to Kirsty, let's go down to Bushmead. There's a church there. I've heard good things. Let's go and see what that's all about. And we walked in through the front door, and everyone was crying. <laughs> I was like, why are these people crying? This is really bizarre. This is really not what I was expecting. Anyway, it became very apparent through the service that it was Simon Dust's last day. And a lot of people were very distraught that Simon was leaving. Him and his family were going to St. Andrews in High Wycombe, I think it was. Um, but my first impression of, Christ, of Christchurch was that it was a church of crying people. And I thought, oh, I'm not too sure about this place. Um, but we persevered, um, and we, ca we were about to go to the Dominican Republic, Kirsty and I, and we didn't come back till after we'd been. And, uh, of course, the church was then in a period of interregnum, which it is now. So it seems quite fitting to reflect on, on that experience and to come back today and see some faces that I'm sure I saw here in 2008. And it made me think about the faithful remnant the faithful remnant that are still here at Christ Church. And I thought that was what I was going to be speaking on because that was the first thing that came to me. But um, I've had a week that didn't go quite as planned. I've had a very disappointing week. Maybe not as disappointing as Theresa May's week, but disappointing nonetheless. I was expecting today we'd be talking about life post-Brexit, but no, that wasn't going to happen either. But this week has been very disappointing for me for a number of reasons. Um, I had a, a long weekend on my own last weekend. I had lots of plans. I was going to see lots of people. I was going to do lots of things. And then I got struck down with some virus. I was like, that's not fair. It's just not fair, is it? You make all these plans and it's not fair. And I was really gutted that I couldn't do the things that I wanted to do. Now, one thing I do know about God when I speak here at Christ Church is often he starts me on one tangent and I make loads of notes and Mel will testify to this. And then I get up in front of people and he goes, no, I don't want you to say that anymore. I want you to do something different. He hasn't quite done that this morning, but where I started the beginning of the week is not where I ended it. But I was thinking about Mary Magdalene and how distraught she was outside the tomb. We're coming up to Easter um, and it focuses the mind, doesn't it? As we go through Lent, we think about our faith, we think about the gift of salvation, we think about our own personal journey. And I was thinking about all the words that would sum up how she was feeling and discouraged and distraught, dismayed, bereft, bereaved. All these adjectives came to mind, but the one thing that just kept coming back was disappointment. And I thought, why disappointment? Why? Disappointment. What is it about this disappointment that doesn't go away? And as I say, I've had a very disappointing week. I was, um, a couple of weeks ago, I was expecting to um, receive something that didn't happen. And I was really, really upset because I was going to rely on this financial event to pay for a car repair that had unexpectedly happened. And I was like, oh God, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. So disappointment on disappointment on disappointment. And this week, I made it into work twice. I felt well enough to go into work twice. And on one of those occasions, somebody who I see three or four times a year said, I really need to see you. And I said, okay. Um, so I met with them, and we had a very nice time. And just as I was leaving, she said, oh, there's one thing. 
She said, I've got this envelope for you. God has told me to give it to you. I'm like, okay, that's not at all weird. That's fine. She said, don't look at it now. But she said, God has very clearly told me to give this to you. So I'm being obedient and I am going to give you what God has told me to give you. So I left her. I went back to the office. I opened the envelope. And there were two checks in the envelope, both for the amount that I had been expecting previously. So the original amount plus an extra amount. And I just thought, how faithful is God that actually what I was expecting that I would have been happy with, he had to demonstrate that this isn't about what you get and what you do and what you deserve. This is about me. This is about how I give to you. This is how I meet you in your time of need. And it made me really question a lot of things. It made me question a lot about my motives. It made me question about where I was in my faith. But it also made me sit up and think, actually, I can do nothing if I do it outside of what God wants me to do. I can do nothing. And I think, as we think about Jesus' death on the cross and all those people who'd been with him, including Mary Magdalene, who'd seen him die that horrendous death, and then, and now what? And what now? How am I going to move on without that? How am I going to cope? How am I going to cope without my partner, my husband, my friend, my mother, my father, whatever it is, how we get to those positions in life, don't we? How am I going to move on? And God says, this is how. This is how you're going to cope. And reveals himself to us. Because he's there all the time. He's just right there. He's there in the garden. And for all her grief, for all that pain, she just cannot see what's in plain sight. And I know that Christ Church has been through difficult times in the past few years. And lots of people have come, and lots of people have gone. And some people may come back, some people may never come back. But for those of you who are still here today, God is saying, I'm still here. I'm right here. I haven't gone anywhere. I'm still right here. I've always been here. You may not like what church has been, but that's people. That isn't God. That is people. So I focused on this word disappointment. Now, this is the point. If you get nothing else out of this morning, this is what I want you to remember because this was like the angels singing in my living room when I noticed this. I was like, oh my goodness, this is so exciting. I can't wait to share it. And if you're not as excited, I'm going to be devastated because I really thought it was like, yes, this is it. So... I thought, right, what does the Bible say about disappointment? So I've got one of these study Bibles. It's one of my many Bibles on the shelf at home. This is the one I chose for today. And I have a concordance in the back. Disappointment. Mm, It's not in there. Okay, it's only a study Bible. I'll get my exhaustive (laughs) Bible concordance. It does look brand new. Um, It's not. Um, But I felt that every good teacher needed an exhaustive Bible concordance. It's bigger than every Bible I own. Um, And it was like doing a a fitness regime just to get it in from the car. Um, Do you know what? There is no disappointment in the NIV Bible. There is no mention of disappointment, the word disappointment. I think that's a revelation because there is no disappointment in God. Is that not incredible? There is no disappointment in God. And as I say, when I realized that the angels were singing in my living room, I was like, that is a real light bulb moment. 
it does talk about being disappointed, but not in God. It says that those who trust in God will not be disappointed. That's in Isaiah. But there is no disappointment in the Bible. And I just think that is incredible. Because we live in a world, and Anne touched on it beautifully in her prayers there, where there is so much to be disappointed about. There's so much to be concerned about. There is so much to be worried about. There's so much to be upset about. We're living in a world where young men are dying at an alarming rate through knife crime. And women, but generally young men are dying through knife crime. We're living in a world where young women, particularly in their teens and early 20s, are prone to self-harm because they don't feel good enough. They're prone to anxiety. I work with a young girl whose anxiety levels are horrendous, awful. We live in a world where we get hit up on all sorts of stuff that really doesn't matter. A world where a man will pick up a gun and go into a mosque and murder 50 people and stream it on Facebook. There is so much that we could be upset about. There's so much we can be concerned about. There's so much we can be disappointed in. We can blame Theresa May for Brexit, but let's be honest, whoever did that job was never going to do a better job than she's done because it's like getting eggs out of a cake once you've cooked it. <laughs> it is. It is so complex. And you think, well, she's done a rubbish job. So they said, let's vote on these eight other things. And they couldn't agree on them either, so let's vote on them again tomorrow. But it doesn't matter. I mean, she'll need a really good holiday, I would imagine. <laughs> but it, it really doesn't matter. The, the ship, I didn't realize that Jenny had been on the cruise ship. Um, it's good to know that uh, you survived that. Um, my new boss's mum was also on that cruise ship last week. And uh, I'm sure it was very, very frightening and very concerning. But God preserved all the life on that ship. But one thing that struck me, and we were having a conversation about this yesterday, um, Kirsty is finally home after four weeks traveling in Asia, and we picked her up yesterday from the airport, and I, I had a window of about three hours with her before she went back home to her boyfriend. Um, but we were talking about the cruise ship, and I said, do you know that I understand that when they were deciding who to airlift off, it was the passengers in the premium cabins who got off first. And it just reminded me of the Titanic. And I thought, we never learn anything from anything. We never learn. God must be up there thinking, oh. <laughs> he must, must he? he must think, will you ever learn? I mean, he's given us all this and someone else has gone through and written all the words out and everywhere that they appear and we still don't learn but one thing we must learn one thing we must never ever ever forget is that we have been given the greatest gift in Jesus that can ever be given there is no gift greater than that and when Mary sees Jesus when he reveals himself. He says, go and tell the disciples. I love the fact he told a woman, woman to do it first. I love that. The first evangelist was a woman. Go and tell the boys. You know, just go and tell them. Um, and we have to do the same. In a, a world where people are hurting and struggling and suffering, we have to be that light. We have to be that hope. We have to be the ones that come alongside, put the arm around, spend the time. We need to be paying it forward. That's quite a trendy term, isn't it? Let's pay it forward. Someone did me a really great gift this week that was out of the blue, unexpected. So I've decided I'm going to pay something else forward to someone else. Because I think it's right to do that. I think it's right if you receive a blessing to bless somebody else, to pass it on, hand the baton on, for no motivation other than I want to bless you. 
And then hopefully that will build a, an environment, a, a community where we all pay it forward, where we all do good things rather than slating people and moaning and complaining. And let's face it, as British people, we do like a good old moan. But let's be the positive people. Let's be the ones that speak truth and light and life and change. Let's be the ones who say, do you know what? We can change this. We can do different stuff. We don't have to do what the world expects us to do. We can be different. We can stand out. And if we stand out, people will be drawn to us and through us to Jesus. Because we don't know how much time we've got. There's all talk now about there could be civil unrest. And there could be. What's that going to do? There could be civil war in the UK. I mean, seriously, there could be. And people don't know whether their jobs are safe. They don't know if their kids are safe when they go out. They worry about their kids when they're at university, when they're at college, when they're at school. There's so much for us to be worried about. But there's no disappointment in the Bible. There is truth. There is light. There is love. There is transformation abound in here. And I'm sure that all the angels in heaven are rejoicing with Simon right now. No doubt in my mind. The same as some of the women that I met through Azalea years ago who have passed from this world, I know are sat with Jesus right now. Because they knew. They knew. They knew disappointment in life for sure. Absolutely more probably than any of us in this room will ever experience. But they knew who they were, just like Mary Magdalene. They knew who they were, but they knew who Jesus is and have been removed from that disappointing life into eternal glory. I mean, that is incredible. So why would we be selfish and keep that to ourselves? Why wouldn't we share it? If I knew the cure for cancer, I'd tell everyone, right? We would, wouldn't we? Because that would be a thing. What we have is far, far, far more important than that. Because we may not cure cancer in our lifetime. But what we can do is offer all those things that the world teaches us aren't there. There's no hope. Oh, woe is us, everything's going to collapse, it's all going to be a disaster. And you start to believe it, don't you? You start to think, oh, it's all awful, it's all dreadful. Well, I got up this morning. Okay, I'd been robbed of an hour, that wasn't nice. But I got up this morning, the sun is still, okay, it's not out, but we know it's there because we have daylight. And it will be the same tomorrow, and it will be the same on April the 12th, May the 22nd, June the 30th, what, whatever date you pick in the future. Because God is faithful, and there's no disappointment in God. And he is always, 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 always with us. And that's just the thing that I really felt God laid on my heart, that you just have to trust that God knows what he's doing. And that's why he's got his job and we haven't. Because only he can do it. And we can try and tell him how. And I'm sure we've all tried to tell him how to do his job from time to time and we'll continue to do so. But actually, if we let go and let God, there is something about that. It says in Proverbs, doesn't it, about leaning on God and not on your own understanding. If we trust in God so completely for everything, it really doesn't matter. We don't have to sweat the small stuff at all. I'm sorry, my notes are a bit all over the place. I've not been well this week, so I can't even read my own writing. It's that bad. 
Um, but this whole idea that, that God remains with us, he's often here in plain sight. He's always here. He's always been here. Whether we've liked who's been up the front and what they've said or we haven't, whether the situations outside of church have been difficult or not, God has always been here. And one thing that I always feel at Christ Church, and I felt it as soon as I came here this morning, is that permission for the Holy Spirit to turn up here. There are some churches where you could take the Holy Spirit out and you wouldn't even notice. It would function exactly the same way. But there has always been that essence of allowing the Spirit to move here and never lose that. Whoever comes in next, I hope they will encourage that. Because the Holy Spirit, the same as the reference to the Son and the songs encouraged Josh this morning, he speaks to us all in individual little ways, but when you put it all together, he's saying the same thing. And what he's saying this morning, through a loud hailer, not sure if you've got it yet, is there is no disappointment in the Bible. And there is no disappointment in God. There is no disappointment in Jesus. There is truth. There is light. There is love. There is acceptance. We are God's masterpieces, people. We are his best work. It tells us that in Ephesians 2.10. We are his masterpieces. We are the poem of his heart. That's the one root word that I know and remember. We are the poem of God's heart. And we must never lose sight of that. We don't have to like everyone that we come into contact with, but we do have to love everyone because God loves them. God created them and God loves them. He loves me. He loves you. He loves everybody outside this building. But church isn't about this space. Church is about, imagine a flat pack. Imagine Ikea had left all the screws out of the building and it's flat on the floor. That is church. We need to be looking outwards. We need to be looking for those opportunities to come up alongside people. Who have we forgotten about? Who hasn't been here for months? Just drop them a text. Go knock on the door. Send them a card. Thinking of you. I have a friend in Northern Ireland, and every now and then she just drops me a message, thinking of you today. I go, oh, isn't that nice? I don't know what she was thinking about me, but she was thinking about me. So that's good, right? There is no disappointment. And God never leaves us. He never leaves us. He showed up to Mary, and then he shows up later on to the disciples. I'm here. I'm present. I'm with you. I care about you. You're important to me. You're not abandoned. You're not alone. There's a great story, and my throat's going a bit, so I'm going to finish with this. Um, And you may have heard it before, but Cherokee Indians, Native Americans, have a rite of passage for boys to become men. So at around, I think it's 11, 12, 13, that sort of age, their father will take them out into the forest, sit them on a tree stump, and blindfold them. And to become a man, the boy has to sit on the stump all night, not move, not make a sound, until the sun comes through the blindfold in the morning. Now, in the forest, there might be wild animals. There might be other predators. There might be people. There'll be unusual sounds. It'll be dark. It might be cold. It'd be really frightening. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine what that's like? But to be a man, you've got to go through this whole process. And the boy sits there and sits there and sits there. And no boy can tell any of the other boys what happens during the rite of passage because obviously they have to do their own journey. It's a very personal thing. So they go through the whole night, and finally, the sun comes up, the sun comes through the blindfold, and he can take his blindfold off. And what does he see? His father sat next to him, and he's been there all night. And that's what God does for us. 
So even when times are dark, when things are not as we would like them to be, when we feel disappointed, God is there, sat right next to us, protecting us, looking over us, loving us completely and entirely, right as we are, right now, no exception, ever. So that may not be quite what I planned to say this morning, but God is good. And I really felt laid on my heart today to encourage you as church, as the faithful remnant that remains, to stay faithful as God stays faithful, not to be despondent. Whoever the next leader is who comes in, you know, to work with them, to build church without walls that looks out, not in. We're very good at looking in. Let's look out and let's just be the people who bring that light, love and hope to those who are living in a dark world outside. We can change the town of Luton, the county of Bedfordshire, England, the UK, the world, one person at a time. That's all it takes. So let's pay it forward. What we've given, let's pass it on, whatever that is, in whatever way we can, and just allow God to use us as his hands and feet to be a blessing to a dark world.